Well, what about the idea that, you know, write a letter to Elder Oaks, write a letter to the First Presidency, write a letter, talk to your bishop, talk to your stake president, but if you're crossing the line when you, when you, as Elder Holland once told me, when you purchase a printing press, when you blog and podcast, you're sullying the good name of the church, you're betraying the leadership, that's something to be handled privately behind the scenes, not publicly in a way that embarrasses and disgraces the name of the church. Mm. And my response would be to, to, to say, what you are encouraging me to do is be complicit with spiritually abusive practices. No, <laughs> just, just, just voice your concerns privately. That's all. You don't have to be complicit. Oh, just John, I've got a vagina. What access do I have <laughs> <laughs> to these men in their plush offices in Salt Lake City? Hey, I'm brown. I'm a woman. You know, I'm a New Zealander. Uh, you know, they've got no interest. They've got no interest in, in the margins. Okay, so why, if you, if you know they're not going to listen, then why speak out if they're ignoring you anyway? Because people need their stories told, right? I mean, you're a Mormon stories. We need, people need, the people at the margins are the ones who need their stories told. Because this is a prophetic voice, it's a, this is the way prophecy works. Uh, we hear the lament and the cry of those at the margins. And the margin, the prophetic work is to speak to the center and call them to repentance for the way that they have sustained these kinds of abuses. That's, you know, that's, that's all in Lamentations and Psalms and right through the Bible. I mean, that's what Mormons don't understand. That's what being a prophet means. Yes. It's saying there's a problem here. We need to fix it. And you're, and you're being, you're, you're actually taking the role of a Mormon prophet. Yeah. But all of us are everybody, everybody. And I believe in a prophetic community in which we are speaking from the margins to the center. I mean, prophetic community doesn't emerge from one person, it emerges from all the stories that we tell, and particularly woman's lamentation is a powerful antidote to the kind of patriarchy, the kyriarchy, the craterocracy, the patriarchy. Women's voices are the ultimate prophetic voice and the, and, 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 and the voices of those who have suffered. Um, you know, if I can put a microphone in somebody, in front of somebody and, and hear their story of lament, I think that's a, that's a spiritual practice. Like to tell me that I shouldn't, I don't, I can't even, I can't even line that up with anything, but a spiritually abusive system that protects the corporate, uh, uh, like an organization. I, I can't spiritually, it doesn't spiritually compute. Right. Yeah. And, and male Mormons are going to discredit this and say, it's not that big of a deal, but it has to be. It's one thing for Sam Young or John Delan or Jeremy Reynolds or whoever to make the criticism. It has to be, you know, there's something about a woman making that criticism that has to be extra threatening and scary. Is that, is, would you believe that to be true? I, well, it's the role of woman. And like, you know, I mean, when I go back to Lamentations, right? You, you have all these, these women surrounding the city and crying at the gates of the city for what, you know, for the, for the travesty done for this community that had like, like embroiled itself and, and, and these systems that were not spiritually thriving. Um, so like it, it, the woman's voice is powerful. It's important. It's the voice of lament. If you have stopped listening to the voice of feminine lament who speak up on behalf of their children and their grandmothers and for half the population and the children that go along with it, then you have, 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 have stopped listening to the voice of, the, of, of God speaking through, you know, the prophet, through prophecy, because that's, that, that's what woman's role is in this. Like men are going to kind of surround the high council table and say all's well in Zion. They always do. And they're good at run, keeping the machinery running. But that's not how you keep a vibrant spiritual community running. You need to include the voice and the lament and the intuition and the spiritual power and prowess of the feminine. If you're not doing that, you're just running it into the, you know, like just kind of into spiritual obscurity. You're there for what financial sake? I don't know. Power? Is, is, is that what it's all about? I mean, you know, we, we, we talk about like people's, you know, like my rap sheet, but I mean, I just think this is about fundamentally, it's about me not meeting the ego needs of my local leaders or the LDS church.
I, I, you know, I have taken myself out of their spiritual authority. I've brought myself under another very independent spiritual, I, I, I spiritually, a spiritual authority that I find profoundly trustworthy. Uh, and they don't like it. And again, if someone's going to say, hey, listen, we live in a world where, yeah, egos are fragile and the church's reputation is sacred and, and it may cause people to leave, be discreet, work from within, be a Maxine Hanks or a Nyland McBain or a, you know, pick your Ali Isom, like be the good Mormon woman that works through you be, be Fiona Givens, right? Be the good Mormon woman that works within the channels to have influence. Don't sully the reputation of the church by publicly shaming and embarrass, embarrassing the church. That's a bridge too far. Be the good Mormon and woman and man that works in the system to make change. And I think they are all absolutely, utterly and completely necessary. We're, you know, but that's their call. I think they, they you know, they, they feel a call to be in the organization and to manage. And I, I just, I mean, I have wanted to feel that, but that's, I just don't feel it. It's got to partly be being a, being a non-US person and being a non-connected to elite, rich, wealthy, white Mormons in the US. Yeah. And being a person of color, that has to impact probably your sense of empowerment to work within. True? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, I mean, look at me. I don't, I don't really have a father. Uh, I don't have kind of broad Mormon connections, although that my, you know, my family is Mormon. Um, I, you know, I'm a Maori woman who's had my own experience. So I, I just, I just, and I've been so disappointed with institutions and maybe that's why I can speak to this institution. I don't know. I don't know. I just, I'm always, you know, I have a lifetime of getting in trouble for keep, for opening my mouth and I'm okay with that. I'm okay. But, you know, I want to like shout out to all of those women who are profoundly important in this community. Um, and if you feel called in, you know, it's like Kate, you know, Kate gets excommunicated and she's kind of given this whole thing away, but she was so profoundly important because she made everybody's question about fe the females in the church reasonable. Yeah, and yet women remain the great sleeping giant in Mormonism because if yeah, they wake, wake up, that? if they wake up, just if watch. If they it. wake up and recognize their power, we could have the biggest changes almost immediately, right? Yeah. yeah. But but women, Mormon women want the priesthood less than men. Mormon men want women to have the priesthood, right? Well, anybody who wants the priesthood has left, you know. <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm just saying that they poll Mormon men and women about whether women, Mormon women should have the priesthood and Mormon men at a higher rate want Mormon women to have the priesthood than Mormon women do. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> That's what? That's cool. <laughs> That's no. Interesting. Interesting. It, means women, it means women are uh, somehow, I don't know. It's, it's, can... it's it reminds me of the slave that says, I, I have it good. Yeah, they're consenting to their, to their own oppression is what they're doing. Right. Which, which, which is part of the machinery. It's the discursive machinery, ideological machinery. To, to get, to, you know, and you asked me why I didn't read those letters, because, you know, there's something in my kind of critical theory training, which says the minute that a policeman says to me, hey, you, and I turn around, I'm acknowledging that authority. Right. Um, yeah. And I become a subject of that authority. Right. Yeah. Okay. The last, the last point is public advocacy for positions which are contrary to core doctrines of the church. And in the, in the appendix of this letter um, is our two blog posts that you made. One is uh in the wake of general conference, let's talk about spiritual abuse. And I guess that falls more in the category of criticizing church leaders, but maybe not. The, the other one is, uh, again, sort of as evidence against you, 
um, is a blog post you made, no, a Facebook post you made that's, that begins by saying Russell Nelson is no more a prophet than you or I. And that's yeah. October 19th. So what th those are some, ev that's some evidence they're providing. Again, that feels like criticism of the prophet. And you had that position six years ago when you started blogging. So that's actually not a new position for you. Not right? at all. Not at all. Yeah. And your leaders and your stake president knew you had that position six years ago. Absolutely. So what what doctrinal positions do you fancy they believe you are um, opposing? What public advocacy for positions which are contrary to core doctrines of the church are you advocating? Do you have any I idea? I think then this is only after lots of conversations because he hasn't really made that explicit is my resistance to calling or acknowledging uh, Russell Nelson as a prophet until he's actually prophetic. Okay. So, so it's not just criticizing the leaders, but refusing to say he's God's one true prophet in God's one true church. Well, either I should say nothing or I um, should affirm him publicly as a prophet of God. Right. So they're not saying you can't believe that he's not a prophet, but you, they're saying you can't say that publicly. Yeah, right. And I got that too. It's we don't care what you believe. You just can't speak openly about your non-belief. Right. But, but also just for the matter of record, you, you're in support of same-sex marriage publicly and you're, support, you're in support of female ordination. And I think those two things got me in trouble in addition to my, you know, uh, concerns about historicity and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do, I mean, female ordination, I just think the whole kind of priesthood ordination thing in the LDS church is a real, like it's, a, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> I know what you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to swear. <laughs> it's a little messy. <laughs> it's a messy show <laughs> a show of messiness yes yes a fecal festival that's right that's right <laughs> okay all right so what make ye of these charges what what do you have to say for yourself with these charges guilty guilty is charged uh well i mean i think it's about hermeneutics it's, it's, it's about interpretation. It's like how you understand that. Did I join the Anglican church as far as I'm concerned? No, I, I serve in an Anglican community and received a baptism into the body of Christ. The next, the next thing appears to be, I profess that I'm a Mormon. I'm not even sure what to do. With <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> yeah. Whoops. <laughs> um, I, and then the third one was what? Not uh, criticizing. Criticizing the, the church, church and its leaders. Yeah. I tell you what, big C church, small C church. I don't criticize the people who are part of the body of this church. The people who are in, who make up the church as the people. Um, I cr criticize the church as a corporation and as a system. So my criticism is about the, the corporation um, and the way it operates. So yeah, absolutely. If you want to say I'm critical of the corporation um, and, the, and its ecclesiology uh, and the way that it manages, poorly manages or mismanages cr faith crisis and differentiation and its challenges, yep, guilty as charged. And I'm just going to say to that, you know, I get a lot of criticism and I, I tend to filter the criticism in two ways. I, 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 I never want to be above criticism and I actually adore criticism from people that mean me and Mormon stories and the Open Stories Foundation well. If you want to make it better, if you want to help me be more effective, if you want to help, you know, give us suggestions or feedback that's going to ultimately with the spirit and intent of making things better, I adore that. Um, and that's something, you know, when it comes from a place of love and support, it's very different from coming from a place of just wanting to destroy and tear down. Mm. Where is your heart in your criticisms? I, I just think that we can do better. That's all. Can we just not do better? Do, doing less harm, right? Do, do less harm, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I have irritations over uh, 
the fact that this tradition is is kind of dying on the hill of certain literal claims, I think that has to go. Uh, it, and it's not helpful to orient all of your pastoral and practical theology around getting people to continue to affirm to untenable claims like be church just be church which means that it's wild and it's chaotic and it's lovely and 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 and, and we're all what is that again if you're saying be church what be church like this isn't church this is just you know be a church i sound very protestant you know like who are we as a church you know how do we be church that's a, that's an important question that we have to ask ourselves not we shouldn't be told what a church is and what our behavior should be and you know should be in that organization but we should share the conversation discern it together about what is church and then how do we become that that's just so talk about anti-mormon that is so <laughs> guilty not as mormon <laughs> <laughs> right right <laughs> <laughs> okay but 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 you know I, I I was I was in an interview yesterday with a Mormon with a, with a a CNN personality and he just made this point after I was pretty critical he said I just feel like you're coming from a place of love for the church you you love the church and want it to succeed and it's true hmm. I yeah. do yeah I that's a fault we love it too much <laughs> I mean that's. That sounds good, but I think it might be true. Yeah. Okay, and then the last the last charge that uh, you're you're defying core doctrines of the church publicly. Well, I don't think he gets. He's a he's a prosecuting attorney, so I mean, he should say exactly what is the core doctrine, so I can understand what I'm defying. I don't know what is the core doctrine. It changes all the friggin' time. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't specify. Because they don't want to be nailed down because then there's a bunch of other people that will qualify under these terms and they're not getting excommunicated. What, what ultimately I think it's always about is Bill Real, Jeremy Runnels, me, Kate, you're, you're getting, you're, because, you're too effective at bringing too much attention to the concerns you are concerned about. And that's a no-no. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe not. I'm like, I'm sitting with this now and I think, that I have had an effect in my stake. I think that's all my stake president really cares about. Uh, I, you know, I mean, he's not named in this, uh, this particular summons uh, because it's gonna be a bishop's court, right? Uh, so uh, it's just really gonna be up to the bishop to decide my future. I don't get a stake council and I could ask for it, but I don't want to have to ask for it. Um, but, uh, what was I going to say? I can't remember what track was on. It's been yeah, a long. Yeah. So, time. so just uh, what's the what's really what is this really about? Is it being a successful voice that the church is uncomfortable with? I think it comes down to the fact that people have come to my my stake president and various other leaders in the church in my stake, and they have wept because of something I've written or something that I have spoken about. And their family members or friends have read it and it has rocked their faith. Uh, and I, you know, and I, and I think that that's understood as me leading people out of the church. And I mean, I understand, I mean, you know, my state president wept. He said, you know, you don't know how many people have come to me and said, Gina's is like messing up my family. And I said, you know, that's, you know, I have a heart for that. And that's very, very heartbreaking that you don't have a good post pastoral response to that. Uh, but you don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of people that I have listened to whose hearts are breaking because they're not being heard and their families are breaking up because of a, you know, a poor response to their doubt and their crisis. So, you know, if you want to, if you want to, you know, match it up person for person, I get it. I bet I beat you. But, you know, I mean, he's concerned about his stake and I think he's concerned about justice being done uh, and me being punished and disciplined for uh, making problems for some people. I don't think it's a big kind of top down thing. This is I think I feel like it's a, lo a local thing. I'd be surprised if it is a top down thing. 
you're the first ever who's who said that. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody else is really just really obsessed with the idea that it's really a, a, a top down matter. But you're the first to say that in your case, you don't think it is. Yeah, well, and, and unless my state president is lying to me, and I said to him right from the outset, I said, please tell me if there's pressure coming. From, and he always has. He said, yeah, got a call from Salt Lake City. I got a call from the head office. Um, and in this case, I think he is, this, this isn't um, motivated from anywhere else. Okay. All right. Well, that leads us to just a, a, a huge uh, number of questions that I gathered from our listening audience. Um, and, uh, and a lot of them you will have already answered, but let's just do a bit of a Q and A right now. And I'll read to you some of the, some of the questions you've kind of already answered them, but you can give kind of brief answers. Is that okay? That's okay. But like my bladder is full. So, you know, this thing we can. Okay. You, you run, run and take a pit stop and I'm going to check in with my <laughs> listeners. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Can okay. look at my beautiful art. What's that? Can look at my art. Oh, you got beautiful art. No, it's okay. Listeners. Thanks for tuning in. We've still got 109 people uh, who have tuned in uh, 110 we honor and, and appreciate you. We, we won't be going more than 40 minutes more because uh, the podcast, the Facebook actually shuts you down at four hours. Um, but I will uh, read some of the comments now just so that, uh, you know, we can honor some of our listeners. So Nancy writes, Mormon priesthood equals loads of extra unpaid labor. That's why when I was a Mormon, I didn't want the priesthood. So Nancy is addressing the, 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 uh, you know, the, the fact that I highlighted, which is that Mormon women want the priesthood less than Mormon men want Mormon women to have the priesthood. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. Um, Julie writes, or it could be that women see the abuse men cause by means of the priesthood and they want no part of that. That's, that's great too, Julie. Or you could just say, it's just not fun <laughs> to be a priesthood leader. Um, Kimberly Anderson's checking in saying, are you guys still at it? She's almost to Salt Lake. <laughs> well, Kimberly, you know, this is Mormon stories. Um, Tracy McFall Austin, who I love, who is like a Scottish version of Gina Colvin, as far yeah, she's as I'm fabulous. concerned. I love Tracy. Do you know Tracy? Yes. I love to Tracy. Someday, Tracy, I want to interview you for Mormon stories, <laughs> uh, if you'll let me. She echoes, the greatest sleeping giant in the church is the women of the church, but they buy the patriarchal line and stay in the shadows. So uh, thank you, Tracy, you're a wonderful writer. If Gina has a, a challenger to her wit and wisdom as a writer, it's Tracy McFall Austin. Oh, Tracy's great. Yeah, we're um, sisters, we're sisters. I bet, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions now. Is that okay? Sure. All right. Um, and then some of this you've already answered, so you can just say I've already answered that, and that's fine too. Um, why did you stay for so long, Gina? Why didn't you leave six years ago? Uh, because I love it, and my husband, and you know, I want to be supportive of him. This is what we signed up to as a couple. I love it. Um, are you, uh, are you, or will you be trying to lead people out of the church? Has it ever been your? Has it ever been your goal to take people out of the church? Have you taken people out of the church? And will it ever be your goal to take people out of the church? Never. Never. I don't, it's not been my goal. Some people have been affected by what I've said. And that has sparked a, you know, questions. Um, and they've left. And I, 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 I own that. Um, but also, I think the church needs to take responsibility for that. It's all very well. I'm the messenger. You know, don't, you don't make a problem out of the people who, who raise a problem. If, if the church's response is poor to that problem, then, you know, how am I responsible for that? Like, just shut up? I don't think so. That doesn't help. Um, well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, don't, I don't have no interest. I, the thing that I really has me passionate um, is the, the theology of spirituality. Like, how do we, how do we hold that? You know, and, and practical theology, how do we do church well? That's what really interests me. Would you ever want to start a church? No, 
No, I did. Ha- I did say um, recently that'd be kind of cool to come to Salt Lake City and do a, a, a like a woman's church. Like that'd be kind of fun. You but- should totally come to. I would join your church. <laughs> But yeah, no, no, I don't think so. I look, I mean, do I even want to be a parish priest and like hear endless accounts of people's, you know, dicky hips and, you know, knee problems? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think that's me. Uh, Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, What about Polynesian spirituality resonates with you? Well, I think that the, the many layered nature of it, that it's actually, it's not like a cognitive idea that sits outside of us. It's actually something that we, powerfully embody i like the idea of the heavens being articulated as um and us being the seed of rangiatia who is you know a god um there's something really powerful about that and and you know there's always the balance between you know that there is the idea that there are profane things there's sacred things and then there is the wisdom to hold those two things together i like that love it Sean writes, geez, how many Mormons are getting excommunicated each week? <laughs> Thanks, Sean. <laughs> it's a bit like um, that. Jerry Renshaw, whom I love, yes, uh, writes, Gina, sincere question uh, that I think might help some people. When you say you have stayed because, quote, I love it, can you share specifically what you love about it? I think I have a memory of it. I have a memory of its great kindness to me uh, and the potential it has to take uh, the lost and the least and the lonely and give them place and meaning. I value that tremendously. I mean, I've adopted four children or five children. Um, and I do that. I did that because I'm a Mormon, because that's what we do. So I've been the recipient of tremendous and radical hospitality. I love that. I love its audacious ideas. I love the idea of a restoration. Uh, so, and I love, and I have loved the people in the past and I love you know, less now, but I'm trying to love them. <laughs> and then it may, it's, you know, like I go into a church building and immediately this is, I'm home. Uh, you know, the smell of it, the feel of it, the sound of it, the cadence of it is utterly and absolutely home. Um, and if I kind of deny that sense of belonging, however traumatic some aspects of it has been, then I kind of deny a sense of myself. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's almost tribal in a sense. It's just yes. your spiritual home. I still feel that way. Ex-Mormons may be mad at me for saying that, but nothing makes me feel as spiritually resonant as the Mormon Tabernacle Choir or uh, singing a hymn with fellow Mormons. I don't think anything compares to that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Jerry wrote, beautiful answer, Gina. You have received and have given within the faith tradition. I honor your journey and wish you peace and blessings moving forward. Oh, that's very kind. Love you, Jerry. Um. Okay, Daniel, one of our one of my dear uh, friends and fans or listeners, top fan, according to Facebook. Gina, do you think it would be helpful if those whom you've helped wrote your bishop and bore witness to your spiritually beneficial influence on us? People have been very kind and gracious in doing that, actually. Uh, I think Natasha Helfer Parker asked what people could do. Um, and uh, and um, people have written very gracious things to the, my bishop and stake president. I don't know if it would change the outcome, but I think it, at, the, at the moment they're sending stock responses to say, thank you very much. I mean, you received one. <laughs> yeah, Daniel, I, I, I wrote Gina's stake president and bishop and got, got responses. <laughs> you got two responses, one from the bishop, but you're the only one to get one from the stake president. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, cool. That's because he, he's got a thing for me, right, Gina? Yeah, yeah. You want to tell them about the dream or not? No. (laughs) All right. We'll just leave that intrigue there. Um, uh, Yeah, I didn't get a sense that they cared about my email much, but other than maybe to be a little scared, but not definitely not. I didn't get a sense it was going to change anyone's mind. Jonathan Streeter asks, hey, Jonathan, uh, is there anything a church bearing the name of Christ could do which would disqualify it from the body of Christ? Well, disqualify itself from the body of Christ, like the Mormon Church has done. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I mean it doesn't it doesn't accept. I mean, I mean it's really problematic because it doesn't say that we are part of the body of Christ. It says we are the full body of Christ, and anyone who you know sits with the you know with the New Testament, I think it's in Corinthians, isn't it? Corinthians, I want to say. I can't remember. Somebody cleverer than cleverer than me would say it. That you know we don't. 
you know, we don't kind of choose one part of the body of Christ to make that the whole thing. So what can it do? I think it kind of, when it says it's the whole thing, I think we've, we've got a problem. I mean, even the Catholics are kind of groaning towards that conclusion that it can't be just them. Right. Interesting. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for that question. Um, let's see. Uh, um, so it's, it says uh, it would be interesting, I think, to focus part of the discussion on theology and the Anglican commitment to including the mind in worshiping God. What, what do you make of that question? Sorry, what was that question again? I just got a message from Peggy Fletcher Stack. Oh, no We're problem. We're having a conversation in a minute. Sorry, Peggy, if you're listening. Uh, I'm sure. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm going to change the question. So Sarah Newcomb writes, I would love to hear her talk about why she wants to stay a member, uh, even though you've joined another church. So yeah, you're, you're, even if you haven't technically joined another church, you're clearly you know, leaning towards the Anglican community is where you serve. Why do you even want to rem remain a member? Why do you even care? Do you feel like it is mean or harmful or can hurt you to be excommunicated? Well, let's talk about this as a, as a general theological principle. What's the theology of excommunication? Mormonism has a, a tremendously harsh response. Like Mormonism says, oh, well, you know, other traditions excommunicate. Like Roman Catholicism doesn't remove your sacraments. It doesn't remove your baptism. It doesn't remove when it excommunicates. It's more like being disfellowshipped. But Mormonism uh, says we're going to take away your baptism, your confirmation, and all of the rites and sacraments. And, and more importantly, we're going to annul your marriage and all of your commit, your all of your um, you know, the efficacy of all of your relationships that you have sealed in the temple. Now think about that for a second. Now I don't necessarily believe that's that's that you know I'm 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 not I haven't signed up to that as a literal thing. But why do I want to? Because I should be able to. That's why. Because there's a there's a principle here. So number one, there's a principle. As long as I wish to retain my baptism, it's the church's duty to to acknowledge that. And, and see it as a trustworthy thing. This is part of who I have, have been, how I've been formed. The other thing is that if you take all of that away from me, you take what is sacred to my husband away from him. That's the hardest thing about it. Yeah. And I'm, I hope to interview Nathan soon because he's an awesome individual in and of himself. Uh, but he takes this stuff really seriously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's one of those people where this is sacred stuff to him and you're it basically yeah. annihilating his his eternal marriage. Yep. Right? So I'm not I'm not alone in this. You know, there are other people gathered with me. I have children I'm sealed to. I have a husband who's sealed to me. Um, I have people who are part of my history and part of my my own formation. Wait, well, what what you know, like who does that? Who takes that away from you? Why can't you just be gracious? Yeah. Anyway. And I was going to say too, it, it just makes the church look so insecure and, and weak, like a, like a feeble despot on a throne whose kingdom is, is shrinking and is, is lashing out out of insecurity and, and malice instead of a strong, confident, bold, you know, broad-minded, enlightened leader. Right. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, if it if it is what it says it is, then it can have the conversation, right? Like it's not it, it's not so embarrassed by itself that it has to excise all of the dissidents. You need for a healthy organization, you need dissidents, you need doubters, you need thinkers, people who are at the edges. Yeah, totally. Okay, uh, these are all questions from listening audience. A lot of post-Mormons distrust organized religion. Why have you chosen another one? What does it offer you? Why is it important to you? You've answered a lot of that, but just give a short answer to that. That's not that organized, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, because as a Christian person, I feel like corporate worship is really important. Community worship. Why? Sitting with, you know, sitting with the elderly, getting them, you know, uh, you know something out of potluck. I think that's all, all of those quiet and, and kind of gentle things that we do with each other, I think is really important. 
Yeah, that that makes sense. Um, uh, why not resign? If, if they're going to excommunicate you, why not just resign as a preemptive act? I go back to my initial point uh, that I don't want to be the one to sever my sealing relationship with my husband. I'm going to make that the church's responsibility. And let me also say that I wrote out my resignation uh, a, long, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago and I gave it to Nathan. Uh, I don't know where it is now, actually. I think Nathan's listening, so I can hear him jumping up and down. I don't, I don't have it anymore. But anyway, Nathan, it's there. We love you. Hi, Nathan. <laughs> it's there. Um, and he is welcome to offer that at any stage. Because we're in this together. This is not just my journey. It's our journey. And so I have to find a way of best acknowledging his, his, his investment in this. Okay. A uh, new topic, disciplinary councils. Somebody wrote a quote. If it's not about love, it's not about God. That's from the presiding Bishop of the Episcopal church, Michael Curry. Um, yeah. What do you think about, you've already kind of said it, but where is Christ in a disciplinary council? It's not. This isn't about Jesus. This is about egos that I've stood all over. This is about boundary maintenance. Like disciplinary councils are just really the kind of the, 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 the thick end of the links of any organization will go to, 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 to stop the change that heretics bring. Like it's, it's a nonsense. It's barbaric. So I don't find Jesus in that. And you, you talk about a heretic like they're a good thing. Absolutely. Need heretics. Why? You said it, but say it again. Oh, I mean, heresy. I mean, what is a heresy? Heresy is to say that which is not commonly understood in a way that upsets people's relationship with the maintenance of the status quo, right? So if we're saying kind of heretical things, I mean, it would have been heretical to say, actually, um, it, do you think that a person who is, um, you know, a, a practicing lesbian can, can, feel the love and presence of God. What a heresy. <laughs> so if, if I can go down as a heretic to say absolutely, absolutely a lesbian and a transsexual, a transgender person can feel the love of God in ways that you might even not be able to understand. If that's a heresy, I'll go down for that heresy. Right. Uh, Daryl wants to know if this is a kangaroo court, if, if you think the decision's already been made. Yeah, I think the decision's already been made. I actually think the decision has been made to disfellowship me, actually. So you're predicting disfellowship and not excommunication? Yes. That will be a first. Yes. And what do you think about that? If you're disfellowshipped, what are your feelings about that? I think I, I ha, I've said to my state, uh, to my bishop, I said, don't disfellowship me. Do me a solid. Either let me go gently, let me go or leave me alone, but don't put me in a dog box in a prison of your own imagination. Don't give me this type, don't, don't give me this designation. To me, it seems unthinkable because why go through all this drama? Why go through the process if they're just going to tell you you can't pray in church and have a calling? Like you're not really doing that anyway. Right. Yeah. So because what? I think they want to preserve Nathan's connection with the church. So that, that keeps him intact, his spiritual, you know, his attachment to our ceiling and and uh, intact. Okay, so for so for uh, Nathan's sake, maybe let's Agent. hope for disfellowshipment. Well, no, I I I I wouldn't be able to tolerate disfellowshipment. Meaning you'll resign or just get more nasty? I I don't know. Probably get more nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what do you think about uh, excommunicating you five days before Jesus's birthday? <laughs> well, Jesus' birthday was on the 6th of April, John. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, but like, Mer oh. Merry Christmas, Yuletide joy, joy to the world, excommunicate Gina. Like, what about the timing? <laughs> well, no, I have to take some responsibility for it because I did say, please get it done before Christmas because I don't want to drag this through to the new year. So that's partially on me. I think they probably would have waited till the new year. Uh, someone wants to know where it's held because they want to show up and support you. I don't even know if I'm going. <laughs> okay, why not go? Well, once again, it's that LTZ thing, you know, the minute that you show up for this. 
um, you kind of, you're con constituted within the system that you're actually by showing up is affirming. Like, I mean, I mean, is there anything that I, I mean, I spent two hours last week with my bishop who's in my lounge room. We were talking, we we're thrashing this out. I'm like, dude, I don't even know why you want to do this. Why don't you just get rid of me now? Because I'm not repenting. Like what, what possibly could you, you know, could you say that's going to make me change my mind? I'm not going to be penitent. So I, I don't know what's the point. Nathan wants to go. A former bishop of mine wants to go. Various other people. My priest wanted to be able to go, but I don't think she's allowed to. Um, but I don't know if I want to put up with that. It's like the reason I don't want to read their letters. I still think that, I'm, yeah, I still think a main reason to go. And what do you think about the fact that you don't even get the honor of a, you know, that a man gets of a full stake presidency and stake high council it's just kind of the bishop and a couple of lackeys. Like, do you feel okay about that? Do you feel like that's no. dishonorable that women <laughs> get the minor, the minor council excommunication when the men get the major council? Oh, I think it's it's a, it's, it's a travesty. I mean, the ideal thing, like, if you're going to have this bull, you know, this stupid bullshit of a a, a, a council, <laughs> like at least have some woman there, right? Have some woman. Um, and, you know, have friends and, you know, do like a Maori thing, bring in guitars and have a sing song, um, you know, have a food, have some food, uh, you know, and, and properly organize this around people's souls, not about around people's egos. So I think it's a travesty, you know, and as much as I like my bishop and he's quite charming, um, but um, this is this is him. Um, this is really about him. And, and, you know, his counselors are great. They're kind of cool people. But, you know, like I've said to my bishop, I said they have about as much understanding of this to spread on a small water biscuit. Like, so they're not, there's like no objectivity here. It's just a bishop who has a knee-jerk reaction, gathers all the information, stand, you know, acts as, presides at this, is the jury and and makes the judgment. And again... Even w women can't even get a first-rate excommunication in this. I know, right? It's a sucky excommunication. <laughs> you have to get a second-rate sucky excommunication. <laughs> I could, I could ask. I've been told I could ask, but I like don't want to have to. I want to have it as right. <laughs> You're not even worth the stake president's time. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> I think the best reason to attend a disciplinary council is to record it, so that it can be shared publicly to the church's shame and embarrassment. That's yeah. just my view. I'm not going to ask you to comment on that. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're not going to comment or you're not going to record? I'm not going to comment. I would say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Does it intimidate you at all? Someone wants to know. Does it scare you? Does it, does it, like, we're joking about it. We're laughing about it. Is there any part of you that, and you, you've, I've used the word barbaric and medieval, but I mean, that invokes thoughts of like torture and, and like, you know, real bad punishment that's, that's truly cruel and barbaric. Do you feel violated or intimidated yeah. by this or abused in, in all, well, in all candor? Probably not intimidated. Um, just exhausted by it, tired by it. And this is Ignatian practice where you sit with the idea of uh, consolation or desolation. Uh, another practice, which is, does it, is it life giving or is it death bringing? So kind of in my rubric, you know, like, as I kind of think about going there, it feels death bringing and it feels disconsolate. Uh, and why would I throw myself under the bus of that? Yeah. There are a ton of questions about, um, is this really around Gina's uh, joining, you know, uh, communing with the uh, with the Anglican Church? Um, you know, we don't really need to address that because even in the letter, uh, they're saying that was only one of four factors. But I do think it's important to note. So we have one listener who writes, I've been attending the Unitarian Church for several years, but have remained on the LDS books. You know, no one's come after me. Um Somebody else writes, you know, I've been Jewish for four years now. No one's come after me. Someone writes, Catherine writes, I was christened in the Orthodox Christian Church six years ago. Nobody's come after me. 
you know, there's just person after person that's saying it can't be about this because there's tens or hundreds of thousands of Mormons who have joined other churches. Yeah. It, you know, just, it's not, I mean, I, I did the audacious thing and I said, Oh, well, I'll do this. I'm going to receive this baptism and I, I'm not going to nix the Mormon church. I'm still around. You're not supposed to do that. It's, it's, it's you know, it's binary thinking. It's one or the other. And I'm not playing that game. It's like, and, and yeah, I'll be Mormon and I'll serve an Anglican community because you're not giving me a calling and you're not nice to me. So I'm going to where people are nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone wants to know what you think about your, uh, your prime minister in New Zealand, Jacinda Mark, Jacinda, Adrian. who is it? Ardern. It's kind of kind of cool that uh, New Zealand's run by an ex-Mormon feminist, right? Yes, who's an unmarried mother. <laughs> Does she know about you? Uh, but I don't know, perhaps. It would be, un mm, it, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, her very good, my very good friend was her former bishop. And, you know, we kind of had been in the same circles. There's no reason I would have, I just knew that she was this, like a little p political firebrand and oh, she's always been really quite interesting. So. In my cinematic version of your life, the day of your disciplinary council, you get a call from the prime minister wishing you luck and sending you love <laughs> and solidarity. She's cool. I, we, she, I adore her. She's fabulous. She's a fabulous leader. Yeah, she's getting great press all over the world. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you can see her Mormon come out. That's so cool. Mm. Um, let's see. Oh, Mary writes, come on, Gina, attend. She really wants you to attend your disciplinary council. Daniel's so <laughs> hilarious. Daniel is a PhD in medieval studies. He writes, John, stop using medieval as a pejorative. <laughs> 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 Lots of medieval kings got excommunicated and they seem to accept it as a badge of honor. <laughs> I love it. Daniel's so great. <laughs> What's wrong with medieval? Leslie wants to know if you feel like this is really that you've been covering abuse within the church heavily recently and that that's the real reason. Do you, do you think that that's a main reason that you're calling the church out about abuse? No. I mean, I certainly that was enough to get no. Sam Young excommunicated. Yeah. It, 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 I, no, I don't think so because this, this starts in May and I think I started really laying on the heavies about, I don't think it's helped, but I don't think that's what the issue is. Bruce wants to know if you think you're being targeted as a wider part of a purge of intellectuals. It's kind of like September 6th, but spread out between 2014 and now Bill Real, you know, Sam Young, you know, it's just, it's just a continuation um, of, of that trend. Denver Snuffer, me, Kate, what do you think? No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. You've already addressed that. Uh, someone notes that Marco Rubio was was once Mormon, and no one's no one's uh, excommunicated him uh, <laughs> now that he converted to Catholicism. Well, they would if he said he didn't think that that um, President Nelson is prophetic. That's true. He just <laughs> kind of moved on. <laughs> That's the sacred cow. When you start touching that stuff, everybody's like, "Well, this is this is it's time for excommunication." So. Someone wants to know if you have any speculation as to why James Hamula got excommunicated. Was it t tied to any financial shenanigans related to New Zealand? I have heard that. Uh, but I've heard other stories. I know that he and his wife now are divorced. Um, so there are stories floating around about, uh, and I, you know, I don't know. I'm just repeating what I've heard that you probably shouldn't gossip about it. But even the New Zealand stuff, like, was there, were there some financial shenanigans? All I've heard is there could have been, but like, I, no, I don't want to gossip about it. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. I respect it. Could, could this, somebody wrote with the great numbers of LDS church members in New Zealand coming from the Maori population, along with the fact that the Maori culture is very matriarchal, does the church not understand that by giving by attempting to silence a key matriarchal leader such as Gina, they are very likely to lose a large part of their membership in New Zealand. Could this hurt the church in New Zealand? I, yeah, like I said, I think I said at the beginning of our interview, there's a conservativeness in New Zealand Mormonism. I think that there are a burgeoning, I mean, yesterday I did an interview with three 
Maori, very important you know, historians, theologians and activists. Uh, I think that the conversation is becoming more critical. I mean, it needs to. So could it, I don't know if I'll lead a movement out of the church, but it's certainly, I mean, I think it's good. It's healthy to have the conversation. And I'm glad to be in that conversation, which is a more local conversation. I think, you know, that's kind of really what I wanted all along. Didn't know I'd be like mostly dealing with Americans. Do you think a lot of New Zealanders are just going to like yawn and, and move on? I think they'll be pretty happy. Like, I, I, like <laughs> I'm not flavor of the month here. Like my, right. my own Maori family have pretty much dropped me. Um, so, yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of people who'd be pretty thrilled about this. Like it's about time. Okay, so you're saying you don't think it's going to cause other, many others to leave? I think what it will do is start a conversation. You know this, like people who have been kind of at the fringes already, who are dealing with all of this dissonance, may at some point begin engaging, re-engaging with the conversation. And what, what I'm hoping will happen is that we'll build up like an archive of conversations that people can enter into if they find themselves feeling marginalized by a church has really paid very little attention to who we are as Maori. But the church has such a hold on people's access to information, their, their feeling of comfort to even learn about things in the news related to Mormonism. Um, unless you've got a, you know, are you, are you in touch with media such that this will be wrote, written about in New Zealand newspapers and talked about on New Zealand television? Do you plan on, doing you know sam young you got to give him credit for his brilliant pr campaigns he always had tv networks and newspapers at every event he did will you have media involved in what you do i mean i'm on a lot of rolodexes i mean last week i got a con i got a call from like a production house he's doing something about on on mormonism i don't i don't have any i don't have any interest in turning this into a media fest I mean, and on, on some levels, though, you know, you and I are talking bluntly about it. It feels like quite a private and personal thing. But I understand that I have a public voice. And so I need to, yeah. I mean, I don't have one, uh, you know, and the trouble with the way I've been with it, I don't have one particular, uh, one particular message. I'm not trying to re-message the same thing. Aaron writes, just want to say that though you are the one singled out in the crosshairs, you are far from alone. You carried my daughter and I on your shirt to the Women's March in 2016. I'm carrying you in my heart through the coming weeks. Oh, bless. That's lovely. Um, okay. Tiani writes, uh, I, know, I know you do love Mormonism and would like to see it engage in positive transformation. How will being outside of it help or hinder your ability to influence the church going forward? I don't know that it will. I don't know. I mean, I, like, let, let's talk about this again next week. Um, there is sort of like an exhaustion with the church right now. Uh, when there are so many big and beautiful and wonderful conversations, which I've been inviting, I, I'm being invited in all over, from all over the world to participate in. That's outside of Mormonism. That's a relief. I mean, I just finished an article to an Oxford handbook of mission. There's so many things. There's so many lovely things to do. So I don't know how how my continued interest in this, except that I just love people, and and if I can be helpful, and as people navigate their spiritual journey, as long as I'm helpful there, I, I I kind of feel that that would be a gift that I can help, you know, with. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. There's there is there a chance you're going to attend your disciplinary council? Is there a chance? Yeah. I'll see on the day. You're going to see how you feel. Yeah. For me, it was cathartic. And for me, it was very affirming. And I'll, this is just heart to heart, excommunicant to excommunicant. <laughs> it, the, the, the best thing about attending it was not what I said, because they just tuned out, zoned out, didn't listen. Um, you know, not how it made me feel, because it, it, it in and of itself is a very punishing, barbaric thing. It helped with closure in the sense that it was such a cold, unchristlike event that it somehow made me feel better about no longer being a member to actually participate in it fully and just see how, how gross and corporate 
and unchristlike it was, it was almost like, whoa, I don't want to be a part of this church formally anymore. Yeah. Does that sound twisted? That's how it was for no, me. No, no. I mean, the thing about it, it's like, it's a surprise. You never know how you're going to react. I mean, there are some days like last week, every day I cried when I heard a particular song. Um, you know, and other days I'm like, ah, oh, I hate this. And then other days I'm like going to be relieved. I don't know. I, I really don't know. It's quite, it's quite the pickle. It's the emotional and spiritual pickle. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's quite a surprise. I, I, I had anticipated the, the, the complexity of feeling that I have about this. How, uh, so, so I'm going to skip some of these questions and save them hopefully for an interview after the, the disciplinary council. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, but people want to know how you are doing. Do you have any self-care routines in place? You know, uh, how are you doing in terms of your own mental health and well-being and physical health? I, I, I feel okay. I went to a blue Christmas service last night, which is sort of acknowledging our grief and our loss throughout the year. And, and that was really lovely to, 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 to spend some time in prayer. Uh, so, is, yeah, I mean, I'm addressing a lot of it with spiritual practice. Uh, so I feel quite peaceful, even though this is awful. I feel quite in myself. I feel quite peaceful. Kind of like a, a lamb. <laughs> no, a lion is just having a nap. <laughs> Do you feel as, as, peef, as peaceful as a summer morning? I'm trying to remember what the quote is. Uh, yeah. What no, I feel okay. To? Okay. And I mean, I don't relish it. I'm not, but I'm not outraged for, by it. If you want to get into this, you know, for, for potential mouthy people who want to, to kind of occupy this space, you have to accept that this, this could be inevitable. And yeah. I, and I long accepted that this, it, it was possible. And there's some asking how, you, how this is affecting your marriage, how this is affecting Nathan. Is Nathan okay? Are your kids okay? Anything you want to share about that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think Nathan, for Nathan, it's a complexity of feeling. I think he's, he's, pr he's, he's more furious about it than I am. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I feel really sad. I mean, when we, we were out at dinner on the Friday night when the, the PDF came through and I just started crying. I'm like, can we just take, I've got that letter. Can we just go to my bishop's house and give it to him and let's be done. Um, and he was very teary about it as well. So, you know, I mean, how is he? It depends on one day to the next. Yeah. He's sad. I mean, he's angry. Yeah. And you're, you as someone who's been through it and, and I've talked to you about this, uh, you're going to feel a lot of mixed emotions too. And you have been, and you will. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to leave with just some compliments. One person writes, will you marry me? <laughs> um, another person writes, Emily writes, Gina, you're in my thoughts every day. You are strong and amazing and will come out of this even better no matter what. Linda writes, Gina, I'm grateful for your wisdom and generosity of spirit. You have shared insights and a perspective that has blessed so many seeking greater understanding of patriarchy from a feminist perspective, spiritual abuse, indigenous identity versus Mormon identity, etc. I wanted to personally thank you for how your courage, wisdom, and strength have touched me. I'm so sorry that you are facing separation from a faith you continue to support. I offer my support and encouragement during this tender time. I do have confidence that your path will continue to bless others. The LDS community will certainly be diminished if they choose to remove you from their membership. Wishing you all the best. Thank you, Linda, for that lovely tribute. Another listener writes, Gina, you're an inspiration. Your intellect, sincerity, drive, and ability to communicate helped me immensely on my faith journey. Best to you and yours. I think there's a lot of people that would join these listeners in just saying how much we've been blessed by your wisdom and wit and courage and strength and, and uh, information and your teachings. We love you, Gina Coleman. Mm, thank you, John. Would you mind if I lift a blessing? Please. This is your moment. <laughs> this is a blessing of healing from harsh religious words. When the hot shame of blood, sorry, I'll start again. When the hot shame of cold blooded words grab and claw at your cells and you find yourself unmoored and pulled apart from divine grace for the sake of a religious idea. 
When your blood and skin's insufficiencies are told you in silken tales composed by indifferent and contemptuous men from distant continents for the sake of a religious idea, when an account of your misdeeds is ordered in fractious timbre and the music of your heart silences and deadens in a subterranean ringing fear for the sake of a religious idea, when your eyes cannot see, your ears will not hear. When eyes cannot see you, ears will not hear you, hearts will not soften to your lament, and you find yourself incarcerated by immutable and intractable fictions of your inadequacy for the sake of a relig religious idea. May the blessing of grace that holds the treasured shine and truth of your good heart give you wings to fly. May the great beauty of your body and the miracle and mystery of the blood that give, keeps you in life explode in you a confidence that keeps your soul's immensity sure. May the sorrows and troubles that once caused your heart to blacken and your body to wander in dangerous places become the seeds of stillness, wisdom, and compassion. May the contrived myths and fictions of church that brought your soul very low in yourself grow in you a great pa passion for justice for all, and may your soul understand the brilliant clarity that no religious idea is more important than the truth of your marvelous divinity, for you were made in the image of glorious, dangerous, wild, and beloved things. Wow, beautiful. The, the listening audience is erupting with requests that you share this prayer in the, in the text of the blog post for this podcast. Do you mind sharing that? I could do, but it's in my book forthcoming. Just a wee plug here. <laughs> oh, tell us about your book. Oh, my book is called Blessings in the Footnotes, and it's going through each part of my life and blessing it. And I want it to start a, a, a spiritual practice. So those are your words. Yes. I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let's figure out a way to make sure everyone has a copy of that in the right time and place. Okay. Thanks, John. Gina, we love you. I feel so sad and angry that I can't fly there and stand outside the chapel, but my family would not be okay with that uh, on the 20th of December. Uh, thank so, you for offering. It's probably, it's likely I'm not going to go. I'll probably go and take a, a private Eucharist with my priest and light candles and have a beautiful meal with friends. So if you're in Christchurch and you'd like to come, anybody, um, my table is open and all are welcome. How do they get a hold of you? Oh, just PM me. Just message me on Facebook. On Facebook. And is there anything we can do to show you support on that day? Oh, no, you've been fabulous. A five-hour, four-hour interview has more than compensated. <laughs> but on the day? Oh, on the day, I don't know. I'm going to keep it quiet. Uh, okay. You know, maybe maybe I feel inspired to show up. I don't, I'm really not sure. So if people have got wisdom about that, it would be nice to hear. Should I go or shouldn't I go? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, Gina, we love you so much, very sincerely, and we admire you, and uh, we wish you our hearts and thoughts and prayers are with you. Thank you so much. Grace and peace to you all.